as I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Jacqueline Dunkley Bent, who is a trailblazing midwife. She boasts a diverse career spanning clinical practice, education, leadership, and policy. She held senior positions in the United Kingdom's National Health Service, including Director of Midwifery, and also worked as a lecturer and professor developing midwifery curricula. In 2019, she made history by becoming England's first chief midwifery officer, advocating for a well-resourced and empowered midwifery workforce. She led national maternity safety initiatives. Currently, she serves as the chief midwife for the International Confederation of Midwives, championing the profession globally. Her achievements are numerous, including being awarded the Order of the British Empire. Professor Dunkley Bent remains a dedicated champion for better maternity care, both nationally and internationally. She'll be talking to us today about changing the course of history, midwives, and midwifery. Thank you. Um, so I am absolutely, absolutely delighted to be here with you uh, today on International Day of the Midwife, a memorable, um, exciting day for most um, in the calendar of our profession. I'm going to share with you over the next 50 minutes, just a few insights, really calling you to action as I tell, I hope, what is a compelling story, drawing on a few insights from my own experience and indeed a little from policy documents. So as Celia shared, uh, I'm Jacqueline Dunkley Bent, currently the chief midwife at the ICM living in The Hague in the Netherlands. Today, I'm joining you from, I've just arrived in Jamaica, in the Caribbean because I'm physically here to share um, International Day of the Midwife and speak with midwives working in Jamaica. But first of all, here today, I've got uh, a slide that I just wanted to share with you that really reflects a little of my history to date. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but you know, there are always beginnings and there are always journeys. And this is a journey that I've enjoyed as a midwife over the last 35 years. As you can see in the uniform, I was a young fledgling um, as a nurse initially and progressed on to do midwifery. And you can see an image there of me receiving an OBE. I always felt throughout my career that I wanted to give back. So giving back for me was really enjoying the journey of student midwives, watching their creative minds, contributing to their journey, mentoring, supporting, coaching. I did lots of writing, some research, lots of publication, always maintained clinical practice, the picture bottom right on the screen, always to be an authentic leader to me, everybody has a different story, meant that I was steeped in clinical practice till I left the UK to start the chief midwife job um, in The Hague last May. Also had some privilege along the way, um, supporting uh, a few royal births. I often felt that I wanted to go back to various countries um, but really didn't have the benefit of continuing professional development. And one such country was um, uh, uh, Nigeria. Uh, I worked and supported midwives, and that's the picture in the centre, uh, in terms of continuing professional development and mentorship and much more advocating for midwives, midwifery practice, um, aligning with ICM, International Confederation of Midwives, essential competencies, and so on. 
And I often thought about the Mayo Angelo quote that people will forget what you did, or they might forget what you did. People will forget what you said, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And I'm sure many of you today can think about a time when that was true for you too. But a recurring theme throughout my entire career has been equity. And I'm sure as delegates listening today, there'll be a few things in your career that keep on coming back to you that become your passion. So with lots and lots of study, hard work, determination, steadfast approach, a dose of courage, I have to say, and pushing through those, bound, those barriers, embracing the challenges, leading through pain, leading through lots of pain, particularly during COVID. But every time pain was felt, there was an experience that was birthed that moved me on to the next trajectory. So a recurring theme for me was the equity, the equity piece, and the realization that maternal mortality and perinatal mortality and morbidity is not only related to the genome, but also to where you are born. Where are you born? That can influence the life course for you. That can influence, influence life or death. So a recurring sentence that I'm going to share with you throughout this presentation is, are we going to throw up our hands or are we going to roll up our sleeves? And that's a challenge to you right now. You've got some great speakers coming up, but for every time you hear a concept, research, evidence, clinical practice, think about your own experience. And this is your time, our time. So on your watch, are you going to throw up your hands or are you going to roll up your sleeves? And by rolling up your sleeves, I mean, are you going to embrace the challenge instead of thinking, this is not mine, this is somebody else's, somebody else will fix this, this is our time, and I choose to roll up my sleeves. So continuing with the equity brief, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen this slide. We're going to I think it's just taking a little time. But this, the, the next slide, when it appears, is really uh, focusing on equality, equity, and justice. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. And I know it's a little bit out of focus, so please do forgive me. I'm not quite sure if the slides are moving I'm yet. trying to move it. I'm sorry. It is oh, not no, no, no. moving. Uh, my apologies sure. for jumping in. Try the keyboard, the right arrow keyboard. That's what I'm using, Liz. And it's not wanting to? No. Nope. That's going backwards. So I think we're, we're there now. So I'm sure yeah. many of you have seen this, and it might be a tiny bit out of focus. Apologies for that. Um, this is taken from the Restoring Racial justice um, uh, website. I became, as I mentioned, from the start of my career right to this point now, I am bothered and I'm bothered, I am bothered about um, equity. So I haven't just thrown up my hands, I have rolled up my sleeves and really challenge and focus on the reality of the situation. And you can see there the equality agenda and that is based on an assumption that everyone benefits from the same support. How can that be when we're all at different starting points? Equity. Everyone gets the support that they need, which produces equity and justice. What have we done? We've just changed how we look or where we start from to ensure that everybody is starting from an equal point. So with that, with this in mind, if we think about, um, if you think about where you are in this piece, reality, equality, equity, and justice, 
how do you see the world? What do you see through your lens as we call each other to action? Action for what? Action for justice, action for equity, equality, reality. On to the next slide. I, when I moved to, uh, left the NHS in England as the chief midwifery officer to take up the position of the first chief midwife of the International Confederation of Midwives, I continued to be bothered. I continued to be bothered. And I reflected, I reflected on the uh, maternal mortality, maternal mortality in terms of the mortality that was a reality for me leading maternity services in England, midwives and obstetricians. The maternal mortality rate when I left England was circa 13.41 per 100,000 maternities. And I was struck, I was struck by the maternal mortality in some of the countries that have the highest maternal mortality. South Sudan, how could that be? I said to myself, how can this be? 1,000. 223 deaths per 100,000 live births. And I've left a country where the maternal mortality rate was 13.41. How can this be? Chad, 1,063. Nigeria, 1,047. CAR, 835. And I looked at the mortality rate for Australia, and this is taken from the AIHW, 5.8 deaths per 100,000 women giving birth. Now I know, I know that in Australia, whilst these data look absolutely superb in comparison to other countries, I know that there are still challenges in relation to equity in Australia. And so it's really, really important, I think, to not just focus on the data because the data obscures the human experience. And for every, every preventable death, there is somebody, somebody's auntie, somebody's sister, somebody's friend within those data. Really, really important to focus on that. And I know, just thinking about the Australian context, because that's where I'm um, uh, thinking the majority of delegates are from, I know that in terms of equity, that maternal deaths for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander females um, is not the picture that is painted in that 5.8 deaths per 100,000 women giving birth. Um, I found some data uh, that suggests that there's a maternal mortality ratio of 16.9 per 100,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander females. Now, if we look at the data by itself without digging deep and disaggregating, we will hear a story that we really want to tell. So the point I'm making is equity is really, really significant. And all of us as midwives, it's time to roll up our sleeves and not throw up our hands and think this is somebody else's challenge or problem. And as I said at the start, I became bothered. I became bothered about the maternal mortality rate. I hope you're bothered too. On to the next slide. I frequently think about who's listening to who. Do we listen to those people who are like us, who look like us? Do we listen to those people that speak like us? Do we listen to those people in authority, but disregard those who we think have no status or have no influence? Or do we listen to people? And I think as midwives, we listen to people. What matters to you? What really matters to you? This is a call to action for everybody that's listening right now. Throughout the course of your career, be you a student, 
a leader, uh, steeped in amazing clinical practice, an educator. Have you been heard when you talk about what bothers you? Have you been heard and understood? Have you been heard, understood, and as a consequence, noted actions that make a difference? It's really helpful to be listened to, but unless you're understood and there's an action, it becomes futile. So again, picking up this, um, the reason why I'm bothered, and, and we're gonna get to climate change shortly because it's all interlinked, but worldwide, worldwide, we know that maternal and newborn mortality and morbidity and stillbirths remain unacceptably high. Dig deep into your data. Don't just look at the overall data, dig deep. With an estimated, this is global estimations, 800 maternal deaths every single day, 5,200 stillbirths and 6,300 neonatal deaths happening every day. And the majority of them are avoidable. But here's the thing, the majority of them take place in low and middle income countries. Totally unacceptable. And I know we have a plan. I know we have a plan, but there's something about pace here, moving faster, moving further, faster, listening and acting. On to the next slide, please. So I would ask you, what do you see on the next slide? What is it that you see? It's taking and, its time again. And for now, this is a rhetorical question. Um, We'll, we'll wait for the slide to load, but um, just have a think about what you see. And the, again, when you see this image that will appear on the screen, this is fundamental to my journey. So my journey is very much um, being a little bit challenged by those that turn the page. And when I say turn the page, this is what you see. You might see something else. You might focus on the type of hands that you're seeing, the color of the skin that you're seeing. You might focus on the page that you're looking at, but there's something fundamental about this slide, turning the page. So, when we throw up our hands, instead of rolling up our sleeves, are we turning the page and ignoring what we're seeing on the page? The first time I looked at mortality and morbidity data for mums and babies and child death, I also observed something really interesting. I also observed the turning the page because the data didn't appear to matter. And today I say to you, we cannot turn the page without listening, understanding and acting. On to the next slide, please. So we have a solution. And of course we have a solution. And this is the exciting part. We know as midwives, as midwives and midwifery, what we practice, we practice midwifery. We hold critical significance in global health care. Of course we do. We are the cornerstone for maternal and newborn health, particularly during humanitarian situations. Of course, we provide the vital support, personalized care, advocacy, and so much more to women and families globally. The ICM, the organization that I work for, is the global voice for over a million midwives. We are in some 117 countries working through some 130 midwives associations. And in that, we have one voice. And our one voice is saving lives, improving outcomes, and improving experiences. That maternity experience that some places don't often think about. Think about, they think about the outcome, they think about the process. But what about the experience that has a significant impact on mental health, psychological health, spiritual health, physical health? So 
midwives hold that solution. On to the next slide, please. So I would say to all of you, as we think about midwives being the critical solution, and the next slide will load, it's taking time. But I see, I see a future where all women, all women and babies and gender diverse people have the same maternity outcomes and experiences as those who have the best, regardless of ethnicity or socioeconomic status. And this is what I'm saying about let's, um, instead of throwing up our hands, let's roll up our sleeves so that we can see this future together. Everybody, equity, equity is key. A future where women and babies are prioritized and protected to receive safe midwifery maternity care at times of humanitarian and climate crises. A future where the death of approximately 800 women a day that die from preventable causes related to pregnancy and childbirth is a thing of the past. A future where the Sustainable Development Goal SDG Target 3.1 and SDG 5 to reduce maternal mortality to less than 70 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births is reachable. A future where an estimated 5,200 babies that are stillborn is a thing of the past. A future where one's chances of being stillborn or dying giving birth is not determined by the fact that the birth has taken place in a low or middle income country. A future where the ambition to end preventable maternal mortality by 2030 will be met. A future where stillbirth rates for high and low income countries are not determined by postcode, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, or the color of one's skin. And a future midwives, where midwives have an automatic seat at the Ministry of Health System table for the planning development of sexual reproductive maternal newborn health plans. On to the next slide, please. And I can have that future. I can have that vision. And I hope you have that vision too. Why? Why? Back to the data. But let's move through the data and see the human experience. Let's look closer. A cheat, and some of you have seen this, some of you haven't. But this really excites me because whilst we can look at things that aren't right, we do have the solution. And I'm proud to be a midwife. And I hope you're proud too, because your presence makes a significant difference. Achieving universal coverage of midwife delivered interventions by 2035 means on average that we can save 4.3 million lives per year by 2035. And even if we're less ambitious, and say 25% increase in coverage of midwife delivered interventions every five years, this will mean 2.2 million lives saved by 2035. And even if we're modest with a 10% increase in coverage every five years, this means a saving of 1.3 million lives per year by 2035. That's why I'm bothered because this means that we can make a difference, an absolute difference. You should be proud of who you are. Educators supporting our students and midwives um, who are um, engaging on continuing professional development, students who are finding their way, clinical midwives who are absolutely front and center every day, day in, day out, 24 seven, making a difference. This is the difference that we can make. We just need to have this globally and preventable death, I'm sure, will be a thing of the past. On to the next slide, please. This is all leading to climate change and our solution to climate change. So I commend to you, I commend to you the ICM's professional framework. This is the profession's framework, our framework. Some of you will be familiar with this and some won't, but it doesn't matter because now you can see, now you can engage. In the center, of course, we have a philosophy, a philosophy of care. 
In the centre, we have the ICM essential competencies for midwifery. And we believe that if every country embraced this model in its entirety, this framework in its entirety, preventable death will be a thing of the past. So essential competencies, absolutely key, creating consistency across the globe, not the unwarranted variation that we currently have. Leadership. Our leaders are really important. Let's get behind our leaders. Let's support our leaders. Let's not throw up our hands when it's time to roll up our sleeves. Research evidence. If we don't know it, let's find, let's find where the evidence is. If it isn't there, let's develop the evidence. Let's add to the body of knowledge. If you're thinking about doing a degree, a master's degree, a PhD, your contribution matters because it will add to the research evidence that we have to improve midwifery practice, to improve who we are as midwives. Midwife-led mid midwife continuity of care. We know, despite the recent evidence um, that's just been published, that continuity of midwife care still improves maternity experiences. It might not um, reduce preterm birth. It might not reduce pregnancy loss, but it absolutely says the recent evidence improves um, women's experiences. In the absence of education, midwives that are educated to the ICM essential competencies, working within the ICM scope of practice, regulated, they, those midwives, midwives like us, like you and I, will be able to work as midwives in the way that we should, in terms of um, being the best that we can be, working within um, uh, auton autonomous midwives is what I'm referring to, working in an autonomous way, advocating, facilitating, supporting, partnering, collaborating with women and indeed their families. And of course, the Midwives Association. Let's get behind our Midwives Associations. Now is not the time to throw up our hands when it's time to roll up our sleeves. Midwives Associations are key and can be your voice if you let that association be your voice. And all that is supported by an enabling environment. So there's no point in having leadership if the environment doesn't enable leadership to flourish. No point in having education if the environment doesn't enable education to flourish and our students aren't able to be in a learning environment where they can be empowered to move forward. An enabling environment is absolutely key. And I'm talking about workforce planning. I'm talking about um, uh, appropriate ratios of midwife to woman. I'm talking about the kit that we need to be skilled autonomous practitioners. I'm talking about transportation to get to women. I'm talking about devices that will help us not to be lone workers for those of us that are working in remote environments. And I could go on. I'm talking about an enabling environment where ministries, governments, system leaders know the value of a midwife and, and absolutely understand that if you have a midwife that's educated and regulated to ICM standards and have all these elements supporting the midwife and the profession, then indeed we will have safe midwifery care. And that is then boundaried and supported by gender equity, equality, equity for all. So really, really important to embrace the framework Every element that I've just talked to you about is inextricably linked. In the absence of one, then the whole framework is weakened. When one is strengthened, the other must be strengthened too, because it comes as a package. This framework supports our profession to remain relevant, innovative, and ahead of the curve. And don't we need to be ahead of the curve? The stakes are high. Why? because this is about mums and babies. If every country used this professional framework, embedded it 
within health systems. We would see higher quality of midwifery services, more fulfilling careers for midwives, and enhanced reproductive health for women, newborns, and their families. So I'm just gonna pause here before I go on to the strategic priorities and ask you to just think about, um, I know it's virtual, but we can still just have a second to think about, do I know this framework? Have I heard of this framework? Is it, does it ring true to me? Could I embrace this? And once embracing it, can I share it with somebody that doesn't know about this framework? You can access this on the ICM website. So just a moment to pause. And we move on now to the next slide. So we've heard about why I'm bothered. We've heard a little about my career in terms of um, recurring challenges that I have about equity. You've heard that I call to action, that I have a vision for the future to stop preventable death, for midwives to be recognized at ministry and health system level for what they do, autonomous practitioners that save lives and improve outcomes. I now focus on the ICM's strategic priorities, particularly strategic priority four. Um, so ICM, the International Confederation of Midwives, for those that are just joining now, um, the International Confederation of Midwives has set its strategic priorities for the next three years. Strategic priority four, work in partnership to ensure member associations are prepared and well positioned to respond to emerging humanitarian and climate crises. So on to the next slide, because this is going to be our, our focus now. We With know- with a reminder that we have about eight minutes left for this session. Um, fantastic, thank you. So the International Confederation of Midwives recognizes, absolutely recognizes um, that uh, midwives, you, we are a vital solution in adapting health systems to climate change. Again, the theme of equity, equity. Lowering carbon emissions overall, it's really, really important. Midwives deliver safe, and environmentally sustainable health services and are the first responders when climate disasters hit. Even when the humanitarian corridors are closed, midwives are on the ground working out how they can continue to get to women and babies. Midwives, a vital climate solution. How amazing is it that we have a contribution to make in this space? Next slide, it isn't time to throw up our hands. It's time to roll up our sleeves. The stakes are so high. Um, so we know that the maternal and perinatal climate hazards, including extreme heat, are associated. And you know this, I know you do, but it's always worth repeating this. These climate hazards are associated, particularly extreme heat, um, with complications that lead to adverse maternal and perinatal outcomes, the most vulnerable in society, the floods, the earthquakes, the extreme heat, and more. Um, multiple cases of maternal mortality and morbidity associated with preterm birth, low birth weight, stillbirth, etc. We know that newborns undergo, you know, rapid development, particularly their Im immature. Um, temperature regulation systems and they depend on their mums they depend on you on us to keep them cool they are vulnerable and yet we have climate change that continues but we are a part of the solution on to the next slide please you will see in this document i i commend this document to you um uh this document calls for, absolutely calls for um, uh, uh, midwives to be front. Actually, it doesn't call for midwives to be front and centre, but what it calls for is action to address the needs of women and how best placed are we to do that. It calls for a threat to um, a climate change 
as a health and human rights issue with a human capital approach. It calls for institutes to be robust in monitoring frameworks. It calls for accelerating research um, uh, and shared information on the impact of climate change on maternal and newborn and child health. It calls for uh, promotion of greater collaboration between sectors to jointly define long-term sustainability. And it calls for us to prioritize all society to take a stand on climate action, particularly for mums, babies, newborns, and indeed children. On to the next slide, please. I commend that document to you. Um, and just a, a, a brief word, I think, about um, uh, this uh, image. We haven't got time, but I would like you again, just a second, to just think about what you see. What do you see? I've taken this. This is from uh, the Burning Man Festival in Nevada, 2016. And it's called Love by a Ukrainian sculptor called Alexander Milov. Two wire frame adults sitting back to back with their inner children reaching out to each other from within. In the midst of climate change and climate challenge, in the midst of all the policy decision makers, governments, ministries, heads of state, health systems, everybody throwing up their hands. Inside, there are people rolling up their sleeves. It's time for action. Let's listen to our inner selves. Time for action. Because we disagree. Ministries, systems, governments disagree about the way forward. But inside, we know our way as midwives, reaching out to each other globally. We can do this. We have, in part, the solution. We can play a part. Onto the next slide, please. So this is just a marginal gain, a marginal gain. And this is an example of a Newcastle, a Newcastle in England, a mum who uh, became the first person in the UK to use climate friendly pain relief. And really, really important as Entenox is a, is a, a powerful greenhouse gas. Not every country uses this. But certainly in the UK, this was a big thing for us. This is a marginal gain. On to the next slide, please. And I just want to share briefly what a marginal gain um, looks like. There are many management theories on how to turn systemic failure into sustained success. Some are complex and others are remarkably simple. Um, and this one really captured my attention. Why would I bring this into this presentation? Simply because the cyclists, in the 2012 Olympic Games um, used uh, this very simple theory that, um, and they reasoned that if each element of their preparation and planning to enter the Olympics could be improved by just 1%, the combined effect would make a winning difference. And they looked at the detail behind everything that they did, what they ate, how their bikes performed, the kit that they wore, the aerodynamics, et cetera. And everything that they changed equaled a marginal gain. Similarly, if there was a marginal loss in time, it would plummet into a loss. So I commend this to you in terms of the marginal gains on the previous slide. Every little thing that you do, not an action today, but a culmination of actions will make an absolute fundamental difference, a fundamental difference to improving and being that climate, in part, in part, a climate solution. We can do our part as midwives. Just a marginal gain will create that effect, collectively, of course. On to the next slide, please. So I'm coming to the end of the presentation, and I'm just really calling you to action. Um, those of you that know me well um, will know that I very rarely finish a presentation without this phenomenal um, quote. And this is where I talk about uh, rolling up my sleeves. So this is from um, uh, uh, the Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. I am not a groupie. I'm not a fan, but I love this quote. My daily challenge, I'm going to change it slightly, and we're coming to the end. My daily challenge to myself is to be part of the solution, to be a joyful warrior in the battle for the soul of midwifery 
and midwives. My challenge to you is to join that effort. Let's not throw up our hands when it's time to roll up our sleeves because years from now, this moment will have passed. Our time as midwives will have passed and our children, our grandchildren, if we haven't got children, our sister's children, our friend's children will ask where we were when the stakes were so high. They will ask us what it was like and I don't want to let them know how we felt, I want to tell them what we did. I'm calling you to action. Last slide, please. So, because of all of the above, because I'm bothered, because I'm sure that you're bothered, what midwives do ripple through generations. What you do can influence the impact of that ripple. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dunkley Bent. I'm trying to take a quick look through the chat to see if there are any questions here for you. I think we have time for maybe one question. I guess I could ask if you could charge our participants with each doing one small thing for the future of midwifery, what might that be? I would say to every midwife out there right now, because of the current challenging situation that we're all in, please align, align with the scope of practice, um, the ICM essential competencies, go to your midwives association, and ask, have we got, why haven't we got 100% of regulated midwives in this country? Why haven't we got leaders that are empowered? Please support us on this journey. Because years from now, if you don't ask that question, you might regret not doing so. Thank you.